Welcome to The Green Rush, a podcast about the business of cannabis. On a weekly basis, hosts Ann Donahoe and Lewis Goldberg talk with the CEOs, politicians, and cultural icons driving the cannabis industry forward. This week, it's another special where Lewis attends a conference. Back in December, both Lewis and I participated in a conference in New York City about the intersection of legal marijuana and journalism. Lewis led a panel on cannabis and the media and was joined by Barron's reporter Bill Alpert and Howard Schachter, who serves as the chief communications officer at Acreage Holdings. Their conversation ranged from how to effectively engage with the media to the language used within the cannabis industry. The Q&A session in the end got quite heated and is well worth the time to listen. There's no better way to kick off 2019 than with an episode of the Green Rush podcast, and this one is a great one to tune into. Don't sit back, lean forward. And now, on to the show. Good afternoon. I'm going to try one more time. Good afternoon. afternoon. All right. So, um, you guys have heard a lot of stuff. I'm recording. I'm good. I know what I'm doing. You've trained me well. Um, And if you guys don't know Shay, Shay Gunther is um, probably the premier cannabis podcaster uh, in the country. He runs Marijuana Today, Marijuana Today Daily. He actually produces I Have a Podcast that I do with my colleague Ann Donahoe called The Green Rush. Um, And Shay's the man. So um, I'm Lewis Goldberg. I am a managing partner at KCSA Strategic Communications. Um, We are an integrated public relations and investor relations firm uh, with a focus right now significantly on the cannabis space. And um, you guys are really in it for a treat because I'm joined by two absolutely um, significant luminaries in the space. Um, To my uh, immediate left is Bill Alpert. Bill is um, a senior uh, reporter uh, at Barron's and has been there since 1984. Clearly doesn't look it. Um, His investigations have inspired stock fraud prosecutions, reforms in areas such as uh, backdoor stock exchange listings, um, which um, you guys would know as RTOs um, or listings on the CSE. Um, He has looked into uh, for-profit college um, investigations, um, the Magnitsky Act um, that sanctions international human rights violators, and over the years, Bill has become the go-to reporter covering cannabis at Barron's. Um, And I want you guys to think about that for a moment. Um, If you're not familiar with Barron's, it is probably the most serious business financial publication in the United States. And Bill is the most serious business financial journalist at that place covering cannabis. Pretty freaking cool. Um, And to his left is a good friend of mine, Howard Schachter. Now, if you don't know Howard Schachter, you should get to know him. He is the chief communications officer for Acreage Holdings. And I heard there's a little bit of hubbub about Acreage earlier. Um, And if you're not familiar with Acreage, they are one of, if not the leading multi-state operator in the United States. Um, But before Howard was at, um, uh, at Acreage, he was one of the leaders of the, um, the NACB, or the National Association of Cannabis Businesses, which is um, a group of companies that have gotten together to try and become the FINRA, the self-regulating organization in cannabis. Um, and before that, um, you'd call him a traditional PR guy. You know, He's done what, what I do and probably what a lot of you guys have done, he supported companies like Facebook, McDonald's, um, Live Nation, both in-house and at agencies, and he launched the Starberry Sneaker. So if you are from New York and you remember Star Stefan Marbury, dude launched the Starberry. Um, Created, launched. <laughs> Either one. So before we get into like a lot of the questions here, why don't we start with what the hell are you doing here? Right. This is a <laughs> which, cannabis. Company. Which of us? <laughs> Bill, which one of us? Me. Bill, why don't Bill you start? start. How, how did you get into covering cannabis? Like, why? Why does Barons care about the the plant? Because uh, it look because it looked like a stock bubble. That's a, a yeah. Okay, how's that? There you go. Yeah. So last year's Bitcoin. This year uh, it was weed stocks. And uh, next year, uh, you know, I may be the. Uh, interplanetary rocketry uh, reporter <laughs> as uh, you know companies come public with their rockets to Mars uh, so it's an industry just like 
any of the other growing industries that we've written about over almost 100 years. Um, it's just, just a two-second uh, history of Barron's. We're almost 100 years old. We're started by this guy Clarence Barron who owned the Wall Street Journal but only printed it five days a week and he wanted to get a little more use out of his printing presses so he printed Barron's on the sixth day. And, and on the seventh day he rested? Yeah, and we were <laughs> and we were a weekly up until the age of the internet. And he did some good journalism even back in the 1920s when he was the guy who exposed a fellow named Charles Ponzi, uh, who, after which we uh, named Ponzi schemes. And he did it by running the numbers and showing readers that the returns that Ponzi claimed he could get were mathematically impossible. And so to this day, you know, we're still kind of the nerdy news publication that reads financial statements and footnotes and points out uh, financial shenanigans uh, uh, along with the other kind of reporting that we do. So. so how about you, Howard? I mean, you, you come from a non-traditional or non-cannabis background and, and only recently have you, and recently is a couple of years, how did you move into the space? Well, um, I would say that I could tell the story of when I was 15 or 50. <laughs> Um, 15 is a more fun story, <laughs> but I'll go with 50. Um, for, uh, for about seven years, um, I was running a PR agency here in town that focused exclusively on the advertising, marketing, and entertainment industries called uh, De Janeiro Communications, working with the likes of Facebook and Spotify and Live Nation and the major advertising holding companies. And a mutual friend uh, came to me with an opportunity for us to work on a cannabis project, what turned out to be the NACB launch at the time. And I really want us to sink our teeth into it. And obviously, uh, been watching the space growing at that point. And uh, the management team just did not want to take it on um, for a lot of the reasons that, you know, I'm sure a lot of us in this room face still every day. Um, and I said, I, wa I want to touch it and, um, and, and learn about it. And so I moonlit, frankly, um, to, to work on it for about a month or two, at the end of which I knew where this industry was going, both co commercially and uh, from a social justice perspective, which I am very passionate about. Um, and before I knew it, I was resigning my presidency and joining the NACB um, as its first head of comms. And that was a close to two years ago. Um, and then when uh, Acreage came calling after that, it, it didn't take long to convince me to, to join what I think is a uh, terrific organization. I also think it's a terrific organization. Um, before I get into the next question, I have a question for you, for uh, Bill. Are you the oh shit reporter? Like if you come calling, should we be worried? Uh, sad, sadly, people see me that way. I, and uh, so I'll, I'll often call and uh, hope to get a phone conversation. And after a delay, I'll hear from the uh, spokespeople of the company saying, uh, send us written questions. So then that would be a yes. Um, but I can tell you, I've worked with Bill. Um, he is not only a very fair uh, journalist, he is open to working with PR people. Um, so I would not say you're the oh shit reporter. I would say you better be aware and be on your game um, and have your facts straight. And um, the, also the, the number one thing I would always say is never lie. Ever lie. You will get caught, and not just by him, but by anybody. Um, so let me, let me get into what, what I really want to talk about, though, which is language. Um, because we all work in a business that revolves around language. Um, and, and um, you, you know, our job as PR people is to be storytellers and to help shape conversation. And this industry, the cannabis industry, is one that has a long storied history with difficult language. Weed, pot, swag, 
all that it's stuff. Great language. It's great language, but but for people who are trying to professionalize the industry, um, Howard, why don't you start? Like, how how do we talk about the plant? How do we talk about the industry in a way that both is honoring its history, but also moves it forward? Sure. Um, and you know, this is a topic close to my heart. I've been thinking about this a lot. Uh, in fact, I don't know how many of you were in Vegas a couple of weeks ago, but um, I met with my peers at most of the major MSOs just to have a meeting of the minds and see what was on everybody's um, uh, thought, you know, at the moment in terms of industry advocacy um, and, and just frankly to be a support group for one another. And we hit on exactly this topic pretty early on. Look, I could tell you wearing my acreage holdings hat um, uh, that um, that using words like weed and pot are not great from an investment perspective, securing those folks that are having a hard time um, jumping over the wall and, and entering the space. But that's really not what it's about for me, because I think those folks will come, and when dollars are there, they will come. I don't think it's about that. For me, and I mentioned earlier about about passionate um, uh, belief in the, in the social justice component of what we all do. Um, there are millions of folks out there, um, grandmothers, parents of kids like Riley, et cetera, who are scared to death, who have had very little exposure to the miracles of this plant. And it seems small, but the words we use um, to describe this plant impact our perceptions. And if there's one potential patient out there um, who won't go because they think it's this, you know, they still think it's about the teenager with bong on the couch because they read about pot, that really irks me. So, um, you know, I know there's a lot of journalists here. I, I wouldn't say you have an obligation, but I would say you have a big opportunity to shape that perception and actually um, impact the number of patients that that access this plant. Bill, I mean, you you write about it, um, and I've read your stuff, and and you use words like weed and pot. So, how, how do you you know hearing that? How does that make you think? Uh, th those are legitimate points, and I'm thoughtful in my choice of words. For example, in writing this morning about Altria investing in Kronos, uh, I didn't. I discouraged my editors from using, you know, Marble Man um, jokey illusions uh, because I don't feel great about uh, cigarette marketing, and I don't want to ease people uh, into smoking cigarettes uh, by kind of adopting and endorsing uh, their marketing branding. And so, yeah, I totally understand um, uh, the point of uh, being aware that uh, there are people who could benefit from cannabis, but who uh, might be scared of it with uh, the language around it. Um, having yeah. having said that, uh, one of my crusades uh, in writing is to take the stuffing out of mainstream journalism, and it offends me to no end when the big daily newspapers uh, talk in a story about how a reporter asked the president such and such when it was the bylined person uh, who is writing the story that you're reading. Um, the editorial we, all that stuff is bogus bullshit and pretension. And I believe that the credibility of journalism comes, of course, from the facts that you're reporting, but also from authenticity and speaking straight to people. And the slang words are part of the beautiful way that people have talked about pot and other counterculture But do you, do you when, when you cover years. alcohol, do you call it hooch or swill? Booze. Or you call it booze? Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, Constellation Brands is the 
booze biggie that uh, invested in canopy growth. And Barron's under the editor who kind of made it into a modern uh, in publication, a guy named Alan Abelson who died a few years back. Um, he was also very informal and slangy in his writing. And to me, that was, again, something that kind of made us more believable than our sister publication, The Wall Street Journal, where the editors had sticks up their asses, <laughs> um, and phony pretensions. And Bar Barron's is all about puncturing the pretensions of public companies that uh, you know want you to think better of them maybe than they deserve if you look at the numbers or do an objective study of the business that they're in. And that's our service to the readers. And so it's all of a piece. But a lot of people who read Barron's make investing decisions, right? They'll read a story on, on Saturday. Hell yeah. And they'll make a buy or a sell decision on Monday. Yes. Right? Um, and hopefully it's a buy decision, right? I mean, look, it's our job as PR either people. Way. But either way. Yeah. So if I was, if you were to counsel me or Howard or any of the other PR people in the room here, not to get an oh shit investigation story, but to, to have you take a fair look at a company. How do we capture your attention? Um, Other than smoke signals. Right. Okay. Um, or let me rephrase it. What makes for a good Baron story? Not so. I'm not saying like, do I call you or email you or text you? But more importantly, what makes for a story that's going to make you say, I want to pay attention to this. Well, right now we're, we'll write about you know anything having to do with cannabis because investors are voracious to read about these stocks, and you can just see that from the way that the stocks have been zooming up, zooming down, and you know zooming sideways. Um, so your job couldn't be easier. <laughs> uh, on, well, <laughs> on, on that regard, um, I, I will. I will. I will. Yeah counter it's not easy but it's 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 easy to get your attention it's not necessarily easy to shape a story yes um but we we try to think of our story ideas the way that an investor is supposed to think about stocks and so we're interested if the stock is mispriced uh which is a kind of term of art for saying that the shares are trading now for $20, but if you really study the business, uh, you'll conclude that they're worth $40, in fact, or $10. You know, we don't care which way. Uh, and so that... And you're not that, allowed to trade, right? No, we don't trade, no. Total uh, celibate priests in that regard. I'm going to leave that one alone. That was way too easy a joke to in make. And I'm not going to touch that yeah. one. Um, so Howard, um, you've disrupted other industries before. You disrupted the sneaker industry when you created and launched the Starberry. Do you see any analogs to cannabis? Well, I do believe it's a disruptive industry. There's no doubt. Um, Here's what's challenging from uh, from a communications perspective. Somebody that's been, I, I suppose, classically trained, if you want to <laughs> say that, um, in in the world of comms and PR. Um, you know, it's really easy whether or not you are marketing a new sneaker or the city of Berlin, which was the first client of my of my career, right right when the wall was coming down, um, or McDonald's Big Mac. Um, you generally have a very specific audience in mind, a specific segment, you know, the 80-20 rule, and you go after the, the super heavy user of, that, of that, that, that product or service, and, you know, that's where you expend your energy and dollars. Cannabis is really different. Um, it's incredibly opportunistic in that we're talking about adult use and we're talking about medicinal and every possible consumer out there um, has a place with with this plant. Um, so again, opportunity, but incredibly challenging in terms of um, consumer communication to figure out where to go 
with the message. Today, we kind of have it easy, frankly, those of us that, that own dispensaries and we do uh, or, or are licensed to operate in, in 19 states, um, uh, you know, put a we have product sign on your door and you're going to probably do pretty well. But that, you know, that anybody that gets drunk with that, with that. You, um, no, 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 no. With get that high. Term. They don't get drunk. Yeah. They get high. <laughs> they get high. Excuse me. Anyway, but the day is coming. Um, you know, the day is coming soon where, um, where uh, you got to really market, um, really market. And so that's what the challenge is, is how wide a swath of, of consumer segments you might decide to go to that makes sense because there isn't I got a lot of real data to work with either. How important is the media in telling your story? I mean, because there's restrictions on how you can advertise um, and, and how you can market, you know, Facebook won't take cannabis ads, Instagram, it's really difficult to get content out there. You, you know, outdoor, you know, out of home is the only place right now that's willing to take direct to consumer messages. So how important is media relations in telling the cannabis story? Well, critical. And really critical to have a terrific agency, Lewis. <laughs> that um, was not a pitch for us. <laughs> um, no, no, no. But in all seriousness, yes. When you're dealing in a in an environment where paid advertising, by and large, just isn't part of the mix, earned media, and not only earned media, but then using it to fuel shared media is absolutely critical. Um, you know, the days of Starberry, which are a decade ago now, we, but that, that, that brand, we didn't spend a dollar on advertising. That was all about, that was all about earned media and, and telling story and narrative and, and the lessons learned back then are being applied today every day. Earned media is, is critical for a couple of different things. Frankly, from, from storytelling and getting message out, obviously, um, but there's still that thing, what we used to, you know, call the thud factor of those, those, those clips. There's, there's not a lot of heck of a, th a lot of things you could put in front of investors, to boards of board of director members, etc. That say, oh, okay, I get what you do, good job. Then you know, a couple of inches high of, uh, of press clippings. But you know, again, without without paid advertising to help today. Um, it's critical. That said, it is so freaking challenging for those of you that don't practice PR in this industry every day or don't, don't practice it at a local market basis. My press materials need to look different in virtually every state from logo on page in some states to words you can use to describe a descent suspensory or retail facility. Um, you know, you have to follow state regulations wherever you go, and that's incredibly, incredibly challenging when you talk about trying to centralize a function at the so, corporate so, level. So, you know, Bill, you, you write, actually, before, how often do you write? Are you daily? Are you multiple times a day? Are you weekly? How often are you writing? Uh, as often as they can get me. Uh, we had an incredibly cushy gig as journalists when we were just a print weekly. We would finish everything Friday afternoon and have the weekend off while our Wall Street Journal colleagues had to come to work Sundays to put out the Monday papers. But now we're all digital journalists. And so, you know, if in a typical week I'll do one, two, or three things for instant publication online and, you know, often something for the Saturday print paper. How much of your time is spent covering cannabis now? Um, I'd say two-thirds, maybe. But, but again, uh, like investors, uh, we're rather promiscuous in terms of our beats and our interests. So if the stocks that are moving or seem wildly mispriced, either underpriced or wildly overpriced, are in uh, biotech, then you'll see a lot of biotech stories in Barron's. And, you know, once that kind of washes through, then you'll see a lot of cannabis stories. And as I confessed, uh, you know, next year I could be a uh, genetic uh, therapy. I have a feeling you're going to stick with cannabis for a while. I mean, this is a $75 billion industry that's only about $10 billion licit. So, and that's, that's as it is today. So 
I've been doing cannabis PR for five or six years. Um, and I remember trying to pitch stories a long time, you know, five years ago and, and struggling to get journalists like you to pay attention to this industry. You're, you're not a young man. You've been doing this. You've been at Barron's for 30 Ever. Forever. Yeah. Yes. You know, that's when they chiseled the, the paper into to tablets. Yes. Um, did you ever think you'd cover pot? I mean, when, when, you, when you started covering this, did you kind of go, what the fuck am I doing now? I, I love telling people that, you know, I'm a, a, a cannabis journalist now. Um, so, no. I... Are, your, are your peers jealous of you? Yes, uh, but uh, I think it's because of the good looks. But. No, I no, I think they're uh, what makes them jealous is that uh, these stories are very popular uh, among our readers, and uh, you know, like like all the mainstream media now, uh, we measure who's looking at your story and from where uh, second by second, and we get tons of traffic for these stories way out of proportion to the size of the companies and their stock. Yeah, you know, it's funny. Um, broadcast does the same thing. And, and um, if, if, how many of you guys watch CNBC regularly? I'd say that's about 30. Sad to say. Yeah. yeah, about 30%. If you've noticed the coverage on CNBC over the last six months, they too chased the, the story of the day and it was, it was crypto and now it's cannabis yeah. and it's the cannabis news business network now is what CNBC is. And, and the reason why is those segments rate. Yeah. They, they do ratings by the minute, literally. And we know in talking to the producers, which segments rate, when are we putting guests on? So these are what we call retail stocks where individual investors are the ones who are buying and holding them. A lot of, what we call institutional investors, mutual funds, can't buy them, buy their charters because it's still federally illegal. So yeah, there's there sin it, clauses in the charters. So. so they're popular stocks. So Howard, you, you know, you've been doing PR for a long time. And as a chief communications officer of Acreage, it's your job to either get your firm to get as much coverage as possible or for you to get as much coverage as possible. How much time do you actually spend educating the media as to the, the business of cannabis and the reality of it as a business and the medical side of it versus just straight up pitching? That's a great question. Um, uh, I guess it depends on the story of the day, but by and large, I suppose surprisingly, I find less and less need to educate on the industry. Um, I suppose it's it's the reporters that we're dealing with on a regular basis that now have some some years behind them now following it and they get it so um, truly from a the business corporate we're, we're finding less and less now um, what we are needing to do is educate about our company versus other MSOs um, because a MSO stands for multi-state operator by the way these are vertically integrated companies that own licenses to produce the product to refine it and then to sell it Thank you, Lewis. You're welcome. See, you always take my words and make them easy to digest. Um, so, yeah, so the MSOs, the MedMens, the Acreages, the Crescos, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, you know, I like to say we're all, or maybe you coined this phrase and I just stole it. We're like six footers on a basketball court of midgets at the moment. Um, but anyway, we all tell the same story uh, at a corporate business perspective, which is about scale and operational depth from boardroom to greenhouse and, um, and uh, focus on brand and marketing and having a lot of um, retail blood in us. Um, what, we're, what I find is peeling away the layers of that onion. Um, to show how we really are different f under each of those buckets. Because um, it takes a real seasoned reporter to understand and go deeper than that opening paragraph. Um, and, uh, you know, humbly speaking, I think we're, we're a pretty solid company in all three buckets. So um, that's where I spend my time is, is, is getting folks to understand all of that. So 
cannabis legalization has been an issue that we've all been dealing with in the industry. Not we. I mean, I, I, shit, I'm only in industries for five years. But but the industry as an industry has been dealing with since the 70s, right? Since, since Nixon really demonized the plant. Um, and really since the 90s, there has been this move of accelerating the conversation about legalization. And probably 2012 when Colorado and Washington legalized for adult use, it became broadly understood. Was there an inflection point, Bill, for you where you said, okay, this is a real industry I need to pay attention to? I mean, what was that moment where you went, okay, this is, there's real money here. I have to start covering this. We're a little different from a lot of business publications in that we are absolutely chained to publicly traded companies. People buy us to decide between this stock and that stock. So uh, necessarily uh, uh, there have to be publicly held companies uh, for us to be able to write about it and then to be interested in writing about it and they have to be of some size. Is there, is there a market cap that you guys have to have, or a company has to have for you guys to actually pay attention to? Yeah, we uh, shouldn't spend too much space on companies that our readers can't put a lot of money into. So uh, if you're small cap, and I'll kind of generously say that that's a uh, billion dollars or less, uh, it's harder for me to rationalize writing about you unless uh, somehow you're still that small, but um, you've got the cure to cancer. Or from the other direction, uh, if you've done things that are so f uh, amusingly, dastardly that it's fun to read about them in an expose, even though it's a small stock that if the story's correct, uh, it'll only get smaller. But it's fun to read and a uh, cautionary tale, to use the cliche. What's been the most surprising thing you, as you've gotten into the industry, and you, you, you've been covering it for about a year or so, maybe a little less, um, what's the most surprising thing that you've, you've found? Uh, it, it, it's... Uh, Great fun to uh, tour the grow houses and uh, to uh, put on the uh, um, surgical masks and the shoe coverings uh, for the ones that uh, try to be most pharmaceutical. Uh, so, I mean, that's fun because I only before that ever used to see grow houses in indictments when uh, the prosecutors would put up identical looking photos uh, as part of the evidence. Uh, and then I think um, just looking at how the money has come from absolutely everywhere, right? From, from Russia, um, from uh, all over the world, people are eager to invest in these stocks and see them as, uh, to, to use uh, an analogy that, uh, uh, Lewis and I uh, are familiar with uh, it's like frontier investing uh, where you're going into Korea in the 1980s or Russia in the 1990s and there are tons of uncertainties and risks that you'll uh, you know have legal reversals or get ripped off by the people that you trusted but the upside is so enormous that sophisticated investors, uh, you know, will dive in. How about you, Howard? What surprised you most about this? Mm. Um, you know, I shouldn't have been surprised because of the nature of the industry and, and, the, and the product itself. Um, but I've spent, I've spent generous amounts of time in my career in the entertainment space, the advertising marketing space, the retail space. Um, and I have not been part of an industry, focused in an industry before, that is just so communal. Um, and truly, from, from the journalist side and the PR person side and the company executive side, just generally speaking, warm, 
nice people who really, I think, generally view what we do as the, the tide will lift all boats. Um, you know, we all have jobs to do. But it's nice to do it with folks, even as I mentioned, I, you know, drinks with my direct competitors. It's just what can we do to support ourselves? Because we all see the opportunity, of course, from a commerce perspective. But I think more importantly, we all see the opportunity for the impact of this plant on, on well-being. Um, and, you know, let's all do it together. So um, I guess had I thought about that more two years ago, it would have said, duh, of course. But until you're in it, you don't really know it. So, Bill, you, you've, you've uncovered a lot of fraud in your life, right? I mean, that's, that's it's a, a large part of the remit of what you do at Barron's is looking for the bad actors. And there are bad actors in this industry. As much as we all want to believe that cannabis is God's gift, you know, there is a tremendous amount of money and there is a tremendous amount of opportunity and risk. Um, but do you think a lot of other industries? Look, every, every, every nascent industry, there, you're yeah. going to see people who get into it for the right reasons and you're going to see people who get into it just to make a quick buck. But there's a really unique regulatory structure that undergirds or, or sh is shaping this industry, right? You've got the federal prohibition. You've got state acceptance in, in 33 states today and then even at the local level some people some towns will say yes some towns will say no do you think the regulatory structure is inherently a good thing or a bad thing from an investor i mean is it is this is this odd regulatory structure bringing more bad actors into the industry or keeping more away in general i think the the regulations uh are Probably an antisocial thing. Um, uh, the operators are happy in states where there are limited licenses because you get a monopoly like a taxi medallion. But that's there are no Michael Cohen. Yeah, that, that's generally uh, um, price protective for them and anti-competitive uh, from a consumer's point of view. Um, in you know, the the whole great thing about what's happening here is that uh, countries are, and states are doing away with prohibitions that are uh, stupid for you know this particular drug. So you know, I, I think the regulations bad in that respect. Um, any uh, licensing procedure. Um, another concern is that it invites corruption. And the uh, awarding of cannabis licenses has already uh, uh, created, uh, led to news stories uh, in certain states where um, the commissioners are in a position to uh, e extract something uh, if you want to get license, or you just end up having to pay the toll of hiring the connected lawyers and lobbyists, and uh, you know, and, you're saying and that that's all we're in, a, in a law firm right now. Yeah, <laughs> hell yeah, um, Howard. You, you you know you represent one of the largest multi-state operators in, in the country in the world, um, and you have relationships with your peers at others. What are you guys doing to make sure that you all act on the up and up? That you are not you know, diving into the corruption, that you are not participating and taking advantage of things in ways that you shouldn't? Well, I, look, I can't speak for, uh, for, the, for the competitors. I wish they were here to speak for themselves. I can speak for us. Um, and our company, I, 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 I believe, is, is a bit unique um, in that we're led by a man named Kevin Murphy. And I don't know how many people in the room are familiar with Kevin or, familiar, or truly familiar with Acreage, but you've gotten to know Kevin, over the years, um, Lewis, there, I I rarely come across somebody as um, as generous, warm, caring, um, smart as heck, but absolutely adamant that at the core of what we do every day is we want to be the adults in the room. We are look, we have fun. We, we, we do, I'm wearing a sport jacket, but we, we get the culture and we like to be part of the culture. Um, but we, but we, we talk about it all the day. We will be the professionals in the room. We present ourselves in a certain way 
to and with every stakeholder of the company, whether it's employees or investors or the media um, or anybody that we meet at an event like this, we are going to, and, and, and then it filters down to the way we operate, the way we report, the way we conduct ourselves as a business. Um, so like anything, it starts at the top um, and, uh, and we've got the guy to crack the whip on uh, operating on the Okay, I got one more question and then it's your turn to ask questions. Um, so my question, each of you, um, I want you to be John McLaughlin. Do your predictions, right? Is he still alive? So it's going to be a boring answer. <laughs> <laughs> All right, well, whatever. Do, yeah. Three years from now, what does this industry look like? Either, you guys go first. I'm no sure. Um, so what's it going to look like? Um, I think we're going to have consumption lounges all over the country. I think we're going to have legalization. Uh, don't hold me to whether that's going to be states' uh, rights or true federal. Um, I think there'll be some combination of, of the two. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that that kids that are 8, 9, and 10 today, when they turn 20, 21, 22, will be laughing about the fact that you've asked that question and what's going on. No different than, you know, my nine-year-old who at three was swiping the TV for the next <laughs> channel, you know? <laughs> about you, Bill? What do you think? I think the uh, federal problems will be out of the way, at least to the extent that they've inhibited banking and uh, stock trading uh, for these companies. Uh, you all have as much expertise on that prediction as I do, but um, something that I know a little bit about from my work, I think uh, it'll also be kind of a f competitive free-for-all uh, with so many MSOs and once the uh, federal hang-ups are out of the way, the Canadians are going to come thundering down, you're going to have the beverage and tobacco companies, and so there's going to be some kind of a shakeout. Yeah, I actually think that, that I'm going to get, even though I'm not, a, I mean, I'm a panelist kind of, I'm the <laughs> moderator, but here's my take. Um, I think that next year, in 19, we're going to see a massive wave of consolidation. We're going to see, forget what you saw with Altria and Kronos or with Constellation and um, Canopy, you're going to see most of these MSOs eat each other, right? And that we'll probably see by the end of 2020, 10 big multi-state operators and probably 10 or 15 brands. So and what I mean by brands are pre-roll company, drink company, they will be standalone companies. So you'll see Dr. Pepper and a Coke, and then you'll see a CVS and those types of things. That's what I think will happen in the next two years. From a regulatory perspective, I think that we'll get the States Act um, at the beginning of 2020, which will open up trading most probably on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, um, which has been the major inhibitor of these companies raising lots of capital. And you see this tremendous discrepancy between the values between the Canadian LPs and the U.S. MSOs, that will invert. And I don't think that you'll see this thundering herd from Toronto coming down here to buy up the U.S. I think it's going to be the other way. I think the U.S. companies are going to end out buying whatever a value is up there, and there's probably not that much value up there. Um, so that's my take. I will say, and I think you both hit on it, look, the reality is too, here's hoping 280 and the banking challenges go away. Frankly, they, they impact us less. We are fortunate to be in a position of, of having a nice war chest and, uh, and having scale and credibility that comes with it to, get to, to, to be able to do things. Um, but there's a lot of great startup brands out there and entrepreneurs with wonderful ideas who simply cannot get the, the funding they need to make a real go of it. And, uh, and so those of us that are rooting for those folks... Um, I, I hope I hope the day's coming for uh, for the banking challenges to go away. Okay, and uh, oh, yeah. and you know I want you guys to weigh in, but uh, another economic bizarre thing about this industry is the way that the regulations have forced it to silo itself vertically in every state, and that just makes no economic and industrial sense at all, and so. 
uh, maybe you guys can tell us uh, if you think that in before too many years uh, it'll kind of organize itself horizontally like most industries and you'll have growers and then you'll have uh, packagers and uh, brand marketers and then you'll have retailers and maybe everybody's going to be retailing it. Your turn. Who's got questions? Hi. Um, I'm coming from the cosmetics industry, which is undergoing a lot of changes right now in terms of formulation and sustainability. Um, they're holding themselves accountable. Consumers are holding them accountable. Um, there's a lot of parallels in cosmetics and cannabis. And I'm just wondering, I'm hearing a lot of talk and not a lot of talk about accountability when it comes to sustainability, packaging, recycling. Um, energy use. Energy use. This is really big and it's changing the beauty industry. Um, and I would advise the cannabis industry to pay attention to what's happening in the beauty industry because it's going to hit the cannabis industry too. You want to take this? Um, L'Oreal Paris, which is one of the biggest conglomerates in beauty, they started in um, a group called Spice, which is just for all the beauty industries, to, um, companies to hold themselves accountable um, in terms of their packaging, um, how they ship, where they ship, where they produce. Where do you see this playing in cannabis? Yeah, okay. I, actually, you mind if I? So, um, luckily, my firm represents the entire ecosystem of the cannabis space. So, not just the MSOs. We work with, with packaging and branding companies and um, attorneys and investors and the like. They're well aware. Everybody knows. Um, they know how much plastic that they're generating. They know what, how, about the water use. They know about pesticides. They know about all of this. And they are all running as fast as they can to get it right. They're not getting it right. They know they're not getting it right. But they know that they have to um, because it's inherent in the industry itself. This is an industry that has forever, for since 19, the 1930s, been in the shadows so that they haven't had access to the capital to do it right. They haven't had access to the intellectual property to do it right. They do now. But there's still, this is as it, as, it, as it stands, a $75 billion annual industry in the United States, of which $10 billion or so is licit, right? That means $65 billion is still in the shadows. The $10 billion knows what the hell they have to do to get it right. But they also have to deal with a screwed up regulatory model that they don't have access to commercial banking. They don't have access to everybody that they need to get it right. But they're running there as fast as they can. Yes. <laughs> no. No, I mean that that is the reality. The bigger players, we think about that every day because it's it's not only good business, it's it's the right thing to do. So we do think about that with every new facility we're opening. But to Lewis's point, the vast majority, the the longest of the long tails in this industry are fighting every day just to stay on top of compliance with their state's regulations. And that's, and that's the thing. Long. Each state has different regulations around packaging, around labeling, around marketing, around production. Every, every aspect of the entire supply chain is completely different in each one of the 33 states that it is legal. But the concept is the, the basic concept, be it the NACB or some other group that will come along um, and, and make this happen. The window is closing. We know the window is closing for this industry to take control of its own destiny. Eventually, the federal government is going to come in. Again, we don't know whether this is going to end up being a state-driven regulated industry or not, but the federal government will play a role. Some number of agencies will play a role, and they should play a role in the protection of the health and safety of, 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 the, of, the, of the population. Um, while we have an opportunity, we owe it to ourselves to show that we can play grown-up and take care of ourselves and create the regulation that the federal government will eventually say, oh, they got it. Sir. I represent a uh, hemp company, uh, and I'm really surprised by everyone who's been uh, on the panels today because I haven't heard anything about hemp. Um, it's, uh, a can it's part of the cannabis plan. Mm -hmm. uh, it's got a lot of renewable resources. 
Uh, I think you guys missed the boat there uh, as far as uh, plastics and paper go. But uh, that, that was just an aside. Um, why aren't we talking about hemp in media? Because it is legal in all 50 states, and the 2018 Farm Bill is going to really open it up. So, uh, fair question. Um, this panel uh, is really focused mostly on the public cannabis companies, and there are uh, there are probably about 600 or so public cannabis companies in the United States right now. 550 of them are non-hemp specific. So it's a really good question. Hemp will transform lots of different industries, just not this panel. My, my jurisdiction's yeah. kind of limited to stocks. Yeah. Yeah. But you're right. You're not wrong. Oh, totally. And, they're look, and I can tell you, we work with a company called Kushco, right? Kushco is the largest um, packaging and, and branding company in the cannabis industry. Well, they're not just plastic. And they are looking, like I said, everybody is looking to find the right way to get it done, right? It's just we are all running as fast as we can. It, and if you think about it, it's like we're spinning those plates, right? And this plate's 280E, and this plate's legalization, and this plate's social justice, and this plate's environmental, and this plate's doctor education so that the doctors understand how to actually prescribe, and this is what medical is. It's like... I can't go any faster. But it's going to get there. And as soon as the farm bill passes, you will see industrial manufacturing, especially since it's a freaking cheap plant to grow. It's much cheaper to grow than high THC product, right? And it's a different thing. It's, it's industrial. It will be grown outdoors. It will be used to make paper and plastic and all that other shit. And houses, everything. Yes. Um, since I have the microphone and I've been at handing it over, I just have, I have a question for this one. Um, you were talking about the aggregation of the marketplace, and we all know that the bigs are coming, tobacco, pharmaceutical, um, Booze. agriculture, all of these things. But then I was happy to hear you mention the entrepreneurs. There are many people in this room that have small businesses that are doing everything they can to be pioneers in the space. My question to you is, as the industry, you know, eats one another up, where do you see the place for these entrepreneurs? Is it in their intellectual property? Is it in bringing them in as consultants? Is it just a section on craft? Where do you see the marketplace going for business owners and entrepreneurs that are already here? It's a great question. Um, so, as I said, I, I, unfortunately, the reality is I think the the rea the reality of today's regulatory patchwork of of states, but not all states, and so many states being different, just makes it very as well as lack of access to capital makes it really difficult. Um, I do believe the IP is is the most is the most important asset. That, that you could have. There is, you asked two different questions. There's all, there is a place for smart people who are really good and wanna work hard um, because of the enormous growth of this business. There's really, there is a need for professionals. Um, but on the product side, we're actually pretty proud. We made an announcement yesterday um, uh, that uh, not everybody covered, but that's a, that, you know that's okay. That's all right. That's all right. It was an all stock. He's not, it's an all stock that's deal. Not, that's not his. That's not no, his no. Team. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It was an all stock deal. Um, anyway, but but we acquired a co-packer um, uh, called Form Factory on on the West Coast. The idea being among several benefits, but the one that we are particularly um, proud of is that if you are an entrepreneur with a great brand, um, that could be a great idea, or it could have real traction in a specific state, with one phone call, you could basically ride the rails of our licenses and our national distribution. We're going to have FDA-compliant kitchens that we will build and replicate in every market and give the opportunity for national scale to start up an emerging brands. So that's good for entrepreneurs. It's going to be selfishly good for us as a, as a revenue stream and to offer that much more choice to consumers that come into our, into our stores. So um, we, we were probably the first to think about it, but, but that is likely to be a direction you see 
others um, others go. Uh, I'm going to actually steal a line from a story that Bill wrote a couple weeks ago. Um, he talked to the chairman of Cureleaf, which is a competitor to, to Acreage, and their, their chairman said that the United States is the greatest emerging market in the entire world, that there is more opportunity here than anywhere else ever because we have rule of law, we have access to capital. So if you are a small um, aspirant cannabis company, don't worry about Acreage. Don't worry about Cureleaf. Don't worry about Cresco. Don't worry about GTI. Make your product, find a market, and sell it. And just build your brand. And, you know, Snapchat competed with Facebook, right? They, they forced Facebook to change. Instagram did the same thing. And so did Annie's, uh, the, the pretzel company. And so does every other startup company in the United States. Don't worry about the big guys. Do your do. Do you. Do it really well. And if you have something that's good, it will catch. If you don't, it has nothing to do with what Howard is doing or what anybody else is doing. It's on you. That personally, even though you were pointing at me. I'm pointing, you asked the question. You're doing me really well. Um, <laughs> any questions besides me? Any of you? Wait, you, that, there was a young lady over there who had a question. You're talking about a state's rights possibility, and that's actually the first time I've heard that. I can't believe it, because it makes sense. But like, how do you picture it happening? Would it be like California would be able to export to Massachusetts, and Massachusetts would be able to export to Canada? Or how do you picture that? Well, I think you're talking about a bill, right? Well, no, there's there's, this, there is a state's bill that has there's been proposed. There's a bill in Congress uh, that they cooked up the acronym STATES for, and uh, it will going to carve out a, a, a way to uh, get federal uh, prohibitions off the backs of the states by saying that where a state wants to legalize it, that uh, if they're conflicting federal laws, most especially in banking, then the state laws will prevail. So that is seen as kind of opening up the banking system and allowing banks to comfortably participate in this and, uh, from my perspective, allow the big liquid stock exchanges like Toronto, New York, and NASDAQ to list companies that are doing business in the U.S. Great. Everyone give it up for... Uh, Wait, oh, Meredith, Meredith has a question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's okay, I don't need a microphone. Sure. Unless you're recording. <clears throat> Hi, thank you guys. Um, Howard, this is specifically for you. As an, as an executive at one of the largest MSOs, which I now know what that means, um, <laughs> uh, what keeps you up at night about the industry, aside from federal changes, but everything else? Wow, a lot of stuff did until I, until I started taking CBD. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, what keeps me up at night? Um, boy, that's a great question. There is a, there's just there's a lot to do. You know, we are a large startup. We are a large startup, so we are building out our operational foundation at the same time that we're serving millions of people. So um, taking care of our consumer education and communication to drive sales on a day-to-day -day basis while we're educating the investment community about, uh, about why they should be taking a look at us is... Um, is a really wide-ranging uh, job. You know, yes, I'll give you a snapshot of my yesterday. Yesterday, we announced a $160 million transaction. I was in Washington, D.C. on the Hill with our CEO, meeting with a few congressmen, while CNBC was a fly in the wall following us for what will be, sneak peek, a primetime special on cannabis that they will air first quarter of, of next year. And then in the afternoon, we had to have a brainstorm about uh, Davos, which for the first time is including a portion of the agenda for, uh, to cannabis. Um, oh, and oh, by the way, we have a groundbreaking in Iowa next week and the opening of a dispensary in Canton, Ohio the next day. So last night wasn't a great night of sleep. <laughs> but that is every day. Thank God for the CBD. Okay, everyone give our panelists a round of applause.